Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, yeah, as uh, as I was introduced, we we produced an electronic lab notebook, and um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of where where an electronic lab notebook can fit in the whole process from doing research through to publishing. Um, and as you'll see, you know, we think it it can play a um, a pretty key role. Does this have a pointer, by the way? OK, great. OK, so I'm going to start by just um, sort of reviewing what are the drivers for uh, this growing focus that we have on research data. Um, so one of them is that the data sets have become research objects of of interest, they're sort of first-class research objects. Whereas traditionally, uh, the the data that underlies a publication wouldn't have been released or made available, maybe only to collaborators or to people who specifically request it. Um, the, the the journal article is the primary object, and it it contains some sort of summaries of the data. That's kind of the old the old model, the traditional model that's been going on for you know, hundreds of years. And uh, you know this is changing now. Um, so we so data is becoming um, more of a, a primary object. So data sets are now uh, quite often citable in their own right. Um, and there's a, there's this increased focus on reproducibility that we've heard about earlier this morning. Um, that means that that uh, scientists, the public, uh, journalists want to be able to look at the primary data to, to have some sort of check that, uh, that, that the, the uh, conclusions in the publication are actually valid. Um, so another part of this is that funders are uh, making, have, for a while now, they've been making um, statements uh, around making data public. public. Um, so, for example, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which I get funding from, now requires that if you uh, any publication that you make that relies on their funding, you have to contain provide a statement in the publication of where the data can be obtained from, um, or if it can't be for some reason, why not? Um, and there are you know good reasons, privacy and so on, for personal data. I mean, this actually goes back quite a long way, and in fact, one of the drivers to the establishment of this, this company. Um, back in, 19, in, in 2002 was that the National Institutes of Health issued a statement saying they were going, going to require all of their grantees to make their data public. And so at that point we thought, well, if you're going, people are going to make their data public, they're going to need it to be organized, and so they're going to need electronic tools to do that, and that's how kind of we got started. It turns out that uh, that statement didn't get backed up um, for quite a long time, but it, we've got to the point now where funders are actually really demanding this, um, and that the, the funders demanding it is, means that institutions are now moving to respond to that demand by by funders. Um, publishers, as we've we've heard a lot this morning, are trying to accommodate this, and and they're trying to uh, provide methods to link primary data to the publication. And then, as we've seen this morning with Science Matters and there are other examples, there, there's now the development of, of publication mechanisms and platforms that are more focused on the data itself. So these are all kind of aspects of this, this growing focus on research data. So from our perspective, looking at this, what we see is that the, the kind of initial um, response to this has been data repositories of one kind or another. So um, the older repositories that traditionally were there to uh, provide access to publications are now starting to allow for uh, depositing data as well as publication. Um, and there are, you know, there are examples of this kind of thing. And then there are new repositories that are focused primarily on uh, on data, and they're they're trying to uh, provide ways of accessing and making use of that data after the deposit. And then, as I said, the institutions are 
the more interested in getting now than they were in getting data into repositories. So most of the UK institutions are now offering some kind of repository for researchers to deposit data. I'm at the University of Edinburgh in addition to being uh, part of uh, research space and um, you know we we are encouraged to deposit into a version of DSpace that, that the university runs and that gives us the advantage that then we get a DOI and those sorts of things. Um, but individuals are using a lot of other uh, kind of repositories as well. And publishers are also moving into this kind of space. So their sort of repositories can become, for example, a parking place to put your data in. And uh, different publishers will list different repositories as acceptable. However, there's been little focus on, in all of this, on um, going through the research process uh, how do you? How does the data actually flow in the from when you gathered it through to deposit publication and deposit? Uh, so the, the the work to you know there's repositories that people have created are somehow assuming that the data that you've generated in your research is sitting somewhere. It's accessible to you. You can easily package it up and deposit it into into a repository. And actually, that's uh, quite a challenge. Um, and that's because people aren't used to depositing data, so they don't tend to, most scientists are not thinking when they start, when they gather a data set, whether it's in the lab or out in the field somewhere, uh, oh, I'm eventually going to have to deposit this in a repository, so I better think about how I organize it so that I can do that easily. You know, it's something you do at the end. Um, so that means that quite often it's a lot of work to get your data into a format, into a, in a structure that is suitable for a repository. And in the worst cases, you find your data is in some system, some, you know, maybe it's in a, uh, a database that you've got you know, a web front end to that you can interact with nicely, but you've got no idea how to get it out of this database. Or it's in some kind of, say, electronic lab notebook that's in a proprietary format, and you've got no way of getting it out. Um, so that's a problem. So what we see is that there's, you need a, some sort of mechanism to kind of streamline this. And we think that um, electronic lab notebooks are one of the answers to this kind of thing. Um, they're, they're suited to this function because they solve this kind of data collection problem um, where people used to write things down in notebooks. If you have an electronic lab notebook, now your information is electronic. And more to the point, it's structured. So some, if you look at, across the range of tools that people use to document their work electronically, um, you know, some people are using things like wikis, some people think are using Google Docs, some people use an electronic lab notebook like ours, and there are, and there are a variety of, of software tools around that people will use. Um, so some of them will give, will, will, encourage you to structure your data as you collect it. Um, but that only really works if, uh, if, if the tools are put together in the right kind of way, and we'll, we'll look at that. So, so currently what happens with electronic lab notebooks typically is that we've got this um, electronic lab notebook and people are busy getting putting data into it. But what quite often isn't available is that all the files that you also have your data in, whether they're images or spreadsheets or whatever, which are out in a whole variety of places. Maybe you put them in your lab, your lab system. Maybe you put them in the institution offers you file systems. You put them in. Maybe you keep things out on various cloud services. Um, can you link those in to your electronic lab notebook? And um, some ELNs allow for that and some don't. And then the second component to this is even if you do have these links to files, which are absolutely essential these days because nobody's typing in all the information in an experiment into, into their no uh, lab notebook. Um, even if you have these links, oops, um, the, the next question is, can you then easily 
take not only what is in your um, in your notebook here, but also these files, which are an essential component, can you easily get those into repositories, whatever kind of repositories those are? Um, so those are the ch those are the challenges, and we think that um, ELNs, if they're set up to support these kind of links and this kind of deposit, which our space is, um, that they become much more useful as part of this whole uh, documenting your data and publishing it. So the key is connection. The, the ELN, you can see, we see the ELN as a connectivity platform. So you can connect up all your data in a structured way and you can then push it to other services like repositories or publications. So uh, connecting to different kinds of files, and exporting in a whole variety of different ways. So, the, so um, what we hear from most scientists is that they want export in formats that are easy to read, like PDF, um, or sometimes people want HTML, so, so a web, web page. Uh, those are the two most common ones that people want. Um, or if it's a very small amount of information, they might want a Word document. So those, those are great for most of the purposes that scientists think about in, in, you know, in our sort of everyday working lives. You know, if I want to share something with a colleague, I can send them a PDF of you know, the, the results of this experiment. Or I can send them, I can create a little uh, you know, websites with the HTML pages and point them at it and they can look at it. Um, so that, that's sort of, you know, useful in itself. But the other really important uh, aspect is being able to get data out of whatever system it's in, in, in the same structured format that it's in there. So you put a lot of work into organizing this information uh, in, your, in your electronic lab notebook can you get that structure out? And that's where um, exporting to something like XML is necessary because that, that will retain the, the structure that you, you put in. So we've, we've gone to quite a lot of work to make sure that all of the uh, information people put into our space can be exported in a big XML archive. Now, for most scientists, that's not particularly, that archive isn't particularly useful because most people aren't going to go and read XML, and they, most people don't have the tools that they can easily use to do something with that XML. But it does mean that if you want to import it into some other system that supports structure, like another electronic lab notebook or a database, or possibly even publishes archives if they, if they get around to doing that, um, the XML can be processed and relatively easily and uh, Put into, put into those kind of systems. So this is a key aspect of making data uh, not only suitable for publications, but also portable, so that people can move between institutions and take their structured data with them. Um, so we, we have done this for the scientists and for um, uh, the, the ability to, to move between tools. We've also created links and abilities to export directly to various publishing platforms like Dataverse um, and Figshare and DSpace. And I'll, I'll end this with a, a sort of short um, video showing the, the Figshare um, export. Uh, so let's see where I'll... Yeah, so, so let me just say a little bit about linking to files. Um, so why are files important? Well, the main reason is that, that a lot of the uh, process of doing science these days involves gathering data in electronic formats. Uh, if you look at biology, for example, uh, there's a huge amount of automatic gathering of data, especially in high throughput situations, and biology labs are becoming more and more ro roboticized, in fact. So the data is becoming, is already in an electronic form, um, images are a, a prime example of this. Um, you know, whereas 10 years ago, it was quite common in a biology lab that you would, you would take your Western blot image um, that you've gotten on some machine and you would print it out 
as a piece of paper, which you would then paste with glue into your paper notebook. <laughs> so, you know, we, we're now kind of beyond that. Um, and, and it's quite an interesting, I mean, I've been working in this area now for, for close to 15 years. And um, a lot of these changes are, it's a, soci a sociological phenomenon. So the, the younger people who are coming through the system just expect everything to be electronic now because their whole lives, everything's been electronic. Whereas older people, people in my generation, in, in biology labs, uh, you know, when they were PhD students, everything was on paper. When they were postdocs, everything was on paper. When they were young faculty, everything was on paper. So uh, it's, it's much easier, I think, now, to the kind of things that we're all talking about, it's much easier to, uh, for the community, the scientific community, to be, to be adopting them because we have um, a new generation coming through. Um, so yeah, so the files are important because you've already got structure in the data. And another key thing about all these files is quite often they're huge. I mean, image data is a good example of this. Um, you can have easily have terabytes of image data related to experiments that have been done. Um, the last thing you want to do is take them off the file system where they currently are and move them into some other piece of software like an ELN or a database um, where they're just going to take up a lot more space and probably be less accessible. So with, with small files, you can think about doing that, thumbnail images, you know, but those aren't typically what people want. Um, sequence data, for example, is huge. Um, so it's not, it's not practical uh, in many cases, and it's even less desirable to put it into the ELN. Um, but it has to be part of it. So the way to solve that is to make, is to make it easy to make links. Um, and most ELNs don't actually support this at the moment, although I think people are beginning to recognize it so that uh, there is work in, uh, in other systems. So in our space, um, various, in, oops, various institutions that we're, um, where we have uh, users are, are doing this kind of linking. Um, so the most common sort of linking is either to lab file stores, and we're pretty much focused on lab, lab science. Um, and in some institutions where there's an institution-wide uh, file system, for example, um, at Edinburgh and at Manchester, so those are two examples where the, the, there is an institution, university-wide file system provided for research data and increasingly scientists are using it. So we have links to those kind of uh, systems. And then we also uh, facilitate links to out to cloud systems, which uh, um, certainly in the US, there are quite a lot of uh, the universities that are using uh, Box to, uh, for their research, for research data. Um, and of course, we also support just uploading and linking this data from um, people's computers. Now, one thing about this linking, one of the really important things about linking to files is, you know, this system that we provide has control of the data that's in the system. So we can guarantee that it's not going to become corrupt. And if you make a link from one thing in our space to another thing in our space, that link will always be valid. We can guarantee all of that. Once we start linking out to these systems, we can't guarantee it anymore. If, if somebody has a file out on their institutional data storage and they move it to a different place, how does our space know about that? It, don't, it doesn't. If they move it from Google Drive to Box, you know, how does our space know? It doesn't. Um, so this is a really big, uh, it's, it's not a problem initially, but when, some, when a, you know, a lab upgrades its file servers, uh, it's suddenly three years worth of data and all the links are broken. That, that can be a problem. Um, so we have, we have in the past had various workarounds for this and guidance to, 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 to labs as to how to deal with it. Um, but we now have a, a new solution, um, which we're trialing with at Harvard Medical School later this year, 
well, quite soon actually, with a company called um, Starfish. And what Starfish do is they, uh, they essentially sit on top of all of these different file systems and they provide a unique fingerprint. It's a bit like a DOI for the file that's guaranteed to be permanent and uh, you know, permanently traceable. So then our space can just talk to the Starfish system and say, and, and just retain those essentially DOI. They're not DOIs, but they're like that. They're an, they're an identifier. And our space can go through the Starfish system to be able to find files, even if they get moved around. OK, so that's, um, let's see, how much time do I have? Two minutes. OK, I'm going to run through the rest of it. So the, the other part of this is exporting. Um, so we think of ourselves as operating, as, as it says here, as a conduit rather than a silo. So once you put something in, it's very important to be able to get it out. And there's uh, data export in lots of different formats and with lots of different kinds of control. So you can export the whole lab's work. You can expect, export all of your work. You can ex export uh, particular kinds of work. Um, and you can associate ORCID IDs with those, with those exports. Um, and we've integrated, as I said, with various kinds of archives to make it easy for, uh, for researchers to make those deposits with just a few clicks within our space. So these are some of the logos of some of the different kinds of um, repositories that we've worked with. So that's, I'm just going to finish after this with a very short video showing you, two minute video showing you the uh, deposits to Figshare. Um, but these are contact points. Okay, let's see if this will work. Maybe not. How do I do that? As of version 1.41, our space is excited to announce its new integration with Figshare. If you're not familiar with Figshare, it's an online digital repository where researchers can preserve and share research output, including figures, data... Okay, thanks very much, Nigel. We've got maybe one minute for a quick question if anyone has one. If not, Nigel, I think you'll be around at the end um, where people can ask you questions. And I should also say that we are kind of really interested in electronic lab notebooks at the moment at Cambridge, and we're hoping to pilot some in the near future. So if you're interested, um, we've got an email list that you can sign up to where you can sort of find out about these trials when they start in the sort of hopefully coming months. Um, so thank you very much.
So um, 